All right, now I'm going to speak. All right, I'm kind of anxious to get going here, right? <laughs> Praise the Lord. Hey, I just want to thank Sam last week for, did he do a great job ministering yeah. last week? Hey, glory to God. Good job. And we got to watch from afar, a good word, and, and I loved your outfit Sunday. <laughs> did he borrow that from you, David? Was that your outfit? <laughs> glory to God. Well, we're just going to continue on with our series. It's been quite a while, but we're getting close, aren't we? As we progress through, next Sunday will we'll, we'll be, of course, Thanksgiving. The Sunday after that will be our last message in Acts until the first of the year because of Advent. So we might get to finish chapter 20, but no promises. We're just, we're not in any hurry, right? We're going to take our time. But we, if, if you remember, a couple weeks ago, we finished with chapter 19. We've been learning lessons from the mob. Have you been able to apply that lately, watching the news, right? You say, yep, there's one of those lessons right there. I can see it, just like Pastor Joe said. We, we, we got a lot from the mobs there in Ephesus. And, and then two weeks ago, we, we talked about idol worship. And we think, well, that's not just something back then, but we realize it's today and that we need to be concerned about the spirit of idolatry that can that can exist in our midst. In fact, it was an eye-opener to me. I know I used the wrong reference a couple weeks ago, but I think you knew the reference in, in 1 Corinthians 10, 13. We all know that verse, right? Because the title of the message was The Temptation of Idolatry. And that Paul said that there is no temptation taken us, but is common to man. But God is faithful, and he will not suffer us to be tempted above what we are able, but with every temptation... He will make a way to escape, right? That we might be able to bear it. And I always stop there. I knew the next verse, but I never tied it. Verse 14 says, therefore, flee from idolatry. I never saw that before and made that connection. And so you'll need to go back and listen to that message and it'll close out chapter 19 and the many lessons we learned. But today we're going to be Moving into chapter 20, and I've chosen the title for the message today, The Ministry of Encouragement. The Ministry of Encouragement. Uh, and we're going to see right out, of the first, right out of the chute in chapter 20, the Apostle Paul is going to be moving in this ministry, and it's very strategic for us today. It's no wonder to me that Paul, and, and don't you like, as, we, as we've been going through Acts, we see the birthing of all these churches and then to go later and read the letters that were written, uh, Philippians, Thessalonica, all these scriptures, Corinthians, Romans, and to realize that we got to watch that all being birthed as we went through Acts and then to see it later. And so it's, it's, it's interesting to me that later on, the Apostle Paul will write a letter to one of these churches in Thessalonica, and he will say these words, and it'll be on the screen for you, 1 Thessalonians 5.11. So he says, encourage one another and build each other up just as you are already doing. Why? Why is this important? Why does it get so much print? Because we're going to see it all through Scripture, this need for encouragement. The reality is this, that if you haven't already, you will be in the battle of discouragement. Anybody here has never dealt with discouragement? Raise your hand. Good, I'm in the right place today. So you've all had experience with this, haven't you? This, deal, uh, this thing of discouragement. It is the enemy's favorite weapon to bring against the church. And, and you're not weird. You're not a failure if you wrestle or do battle with discouragement. It, don't think some strange thing has come upon you because it, even the great heroes of faith dealt with discouragement. The Apostle Paul himself, we saw a few weeks ago when we read in 2 Corinthians, he described what it was like in Ephesus. We didn't see it in Acts, but later he talked about it, and how he was at the end of himself and thought he would die. And it, it sounded like he was struggling. And, and, and we have a tendency to kind of elevate the Apostle Paul like he's Superman or something. But he's just like you and me. And he dealt with discouragement, and you will deal with discouragement too. The enemy loves this weapon of discouragement because it causes us sometimes to be paralyzed. We begin to doubt. We lose our courage. And oftentimes we find ourselves even wondering if God is faithful or does he even really exist? Have you ever been there? 
If you have, don't think there's something wrong with you. It's the enemy trying to discourage us. But God has an antidote, and, and it's encouragement. I, it's not in our notes today, but remember the five Ds. You always got to watch out for these five Ds. This is how that works. It usually starts with disappointment. You ever been disappointed? You ever had an unfulfilled expectation? You, did God never not come through for you? Maybe you've been in prayer and nothing's happening, and you're, you know, that, that's disappointment. What, oftentimes, that will lead to discouragement. And, and if discouragement is not dealt with, that will lead to depression. And if depression is not dealt with, it will lead to despair. And if despair is not dealt with, it will lead to death. That could be the death of a relationship. It could be the death of a ministry. It could be physical death. I've seen it. And so that's why this topic is so important. It's not just some feel-good message about, oh, good, we're all going to be encouraged today. It is a war. It's a battle. I experience it, so do you. There's times I am very discouraged. Sometimes I'm discouraged. I don't know why. And sometimes, I, have you ever felt depressed and you don't know why? It's the, the enemy. What's he trying to do? He's wanting us to pull back. And it, it's, it's as old as time itself. You'll see it all through the scripture. So I looked up in Webster to find out, well, what is encouragement? And this, in the English, this is the definition. To encourage is to inspire someone with courage, support, confidence, or hope. Anybody need that today? Are you, yeah? yeah? Okay. Uh, isn't it interesting? Encourage. You see the word courage in there, don't you? Encourage. I mean, when you encourage someone, you put courage inside of them. It's such an important ministry, and to, it, we support, we bring confidence. You're going to see that in the text today as we read it. We will find the ministry of, of encouragement right from the first verse. So I'm going to put it on the screen for you, and let's look at the first three verses of chapter 20. You're going to see this ministry in play. Here it is. When the uproar had ended, Paul sent for the disciples, and after encouraging them, he said goodbye and set out for Macedonia. He traveled throughout the area, speaking many words of what? Encouragement. He spoke it to the people and finally arrived in Greece, where he stayed three months. Because some Jews had plotted against him, just as he was about to sail for Syria, he decided to go back through Macedonia. Interesting, isn't it? He had plans. He's trying to get to Jerusalem, right? And then on to Rome. That's his goal. And he wants to get to Jerusalem by Pentecost. So he's still celebrating the feast, isn't he? As a New Testament believer, we see him doing that. And he's got plans. However, sometimes, how many of you know your plans have to be tweaked? I, if we could just tell Paul right now what's waiting for him. I don't know. He kind of has a little idea. But there's some experiences he's going to have that we're going to experience with him. And he's going to need some encouragement. But isn't it interesting? After the uproar had ended, all, there's all this opposition going on. Do we still experience opposition? I was asking myself the question on my porch the other day, what, what am I doing that deserves opposition? Am I, am I doing things that would generate opposition or am I not a threat at all? Uh, if you're having opposition, that's not necessarily a bad sign. But, it, but know that you will need encouragement. You will need encouragement. It, the Greek word for encouragement in this text, we'll put it on the screen for you, is parakaleo. It means to come alongside, to call or invite, to call out. And we're going to see, we're going to see Paul doing that. In fact, take out your insert. You can turn it over there, right, right there. You can fill in the definition of our word today, to come alongside, to call out, to speak into, to invite. This is the word that the Apostle Paul is using. And what I want to do today, and take your insert, you'll see three doors. I want to look at three doors that open to us when we're using the ministry of encouragement. Three, th three things that will open to us, th three things that will be possible if we can learn to move in the ministry of encouragement like the Apostle Paul is demonstrating for us today. Here's the, here's the first one. This is very important. The first benefit of encouragement is it will bring strength and endurance. Strength and endurance. In fact, if you look through Acts, take your pen every time you find in the book of Acts and they encourage them and strengthen the brethren. Those two words always seem to go together. They encourage them and strengthen the brother. All through the book of Acts, you see it. Here's just one example, Acts 14. We, if you think back in the series, they were preaching, and they 
think great things were happening. And they returned to Lystra and Iconium and Antioch, strengthening the disciples and encouraging them to remain true to the faith. Was there a problem? Yeah. In fact, the next verse tells you everything you need to know. We must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God. So what he was doing, he was encouraging them because they were going through hardships. They, they were being opposed and they wanted to strengthen them. Why? So that, he says that they would remain true to the faith. Is that ever at risk for you? It is. I see people get so discouraged, they walk away. And, and so they, Paul recognized that. In the early days of the church, it was true. So why wouldn't it be true even for us today? There will be times when we might feel that level of discouragement. We even doubt God. We want, we're just so disappointed, so discouraged. And we need the, we need the ministry of encouragement. And, and that's what the church is all about. That's what the church is all about. In Acts 15, and there was great joy throughout the church that day as they read the encouraging message. Remember, this is when the church in Jerusalem wrote the Gentile church and they read the letter, they took it to them, read it, and it brought them great encouragement. What do you mean? Comfort, right? Hope, right? Courage. It was put, when they read it, it just really built a, a spirit of encouragement. And then it says, and Judas and Silas spoke at length to the believers, encouraging and strengthening their faith. So whenever encouragement is present, strength is present. It makes us strong. That's why this ministry is so important. Anybody need that today? Anybody need a little strength? This is in 2 Corinthians 1. This is a great scripture. This is a scripture before the scripture we read a few weeks ago where Paul was describing what he felt like. Here's what preceded that. Fascinating. All praise to God, he says, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is our merciful Father, the source of all comfort. Same word. Same word, paraclete, encouragement, the, the God of all comfort. He comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort others. Are we going to have troubles? Yeah, that's why this ministry is so important. The reason we need the ministry of encouragement is because we're going to be discouraged, and sometimes it's because of the many troubles. Jesus said in this life, you're going to have trouble, and then he said something really strange. He said, be of good cheer. What? Yeah, I've overcome the world. Is that encouraging? If you're going through troubles, that would really encourage me to know that, right? He says, and when they are troubled, we, when, when they are troubled, we will be able to give them the same comfort God has given to us. When you receive encouragement, you then give encouragement. Is that right? He who refreshes others will himself be refreshed. Isn't that what the scripture says? Yeah. So as we, if you want encouragement, just start encouraging other people and you'll receive it back in turn. For the more we suffer for Christ, the more God will shower us. I love this, shower us with his comfort or encouragement through Christ. So when you're going through troubles, God's going to shower you with encouragement. How's he going to do that? Even when we are weighed down with troubles, it is for our comfort and your comfort and salvation. For when we ourselves are comforted, we will certainly comfort you. Then you can patiently, here's our word, endure the same things that we're going through. I mean, when, I need, when I'm in a bad time, I like somebody to speak into my life who's been there, right? I don't want theory. I want somebody who's had the experience. And so if you've been through some tough times, you could be a great encourager to people who are going through that right now. Nobody can speak into it like you can. I always say, I like to follow somebody that walks with a limp. <laughs> you know, hey, doctrine's good, but hey, have you been in the trenches? I have. I want to hear from you. And it will, we can encourage one another with our own experiences. A great example of this, and you probably, you've seen this picture before, it's from 1992 in the Summer Olympics in Barcelona, Spain. This, you know this guy, Derek Redmond. He was a British runner and was competing in the 400 meter race. He'd already held the national record in the event and most important, his father was in the stands. And as you know, if, if you followed this event, during the semifinal heat, uh, Redmond was leading the pack. He was in front, fully expected to take the gold medal. But about 157 meters away from the finish line, his right hamstring suddenly popped in his leg. If you've ever had that kind of industry, you, type of injury, you know what happened, right? And he fell to the ground. And the other runners all stopped to help him. No. <laughs> they raced right on by him to the finish line. You ever feel like that? You're laying down, everybody else just racing right by you. 
Well, Redmond was determined to finish, and he stood up, and he started hobbling towards the finish line, but the pain was so great, they thought he probably wasn't going to make it. But remember, his father was in the stands, and suddenly he burst to his feet. He jumped over the, the little fence. Security tried to stop him, and he kept shouting, I'm his father. I'm his father. I'm his father. And he ran past the guards, and in this picture, this is the famous picture that many of you have already seen. He came alongside his son, Paracaleo. He came alongside his son. He put his arm around him and encouraged him, kept speaking to him, and helped him get to the finish line. And as they were hobbling down the track, 65,000 fans stood to their feet and applauded as they made their way down the track. Redmond said at the end, I didn't get the gold medal, but I did finish the race. Apostle Paul said, I fought a good fight, and I have finished the race. Isn't that what it's about? I think this really relates to our life sometimes. We can be really excelling and doing well, and out of nowhere comes some event or tragedy, and we find ourselves flat on our faces. But Paul knew about this. He wrote about it before. He said, I'm hard-pressed on every side, but I'm not crushed. He said, I'm perplexed, but I'm not in despair. He said, I'm persecuted, but I'm not alone. He, he said, I am knocked down, but I am not destroyed. I see Redmond's father being like our Heavenly Father, right? Because you know sometimes not every race is going to end well, and sometimes it's going to be difficult. But your father... And I can just see him pushing through the crowd. I'm his father. I'm her father. I'm your father. And I'm, I'm called to come alongside. Well, here's another experience that's made possible through the ministry of encouragement. When you open this door, you're going to walk right into the Holy Spirit anointing. The, the, the ministry of encouragement will always bring you into that anointing of the Holy Spirit. How so, Pastor? Well, in John 14... Jesus was telling the disciples that I will pray to the Father and he will give you another helper. Some of your translations will say comforter. It's the same word, helper. Para, a para, he's going to be the paraclete. He's going to come alongside. This is a major role, the Holy Spirit. And he, and he, he will abide with you forever. Wow. Does that encourage you a little bit? That's his role. The spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him for he dwells with you and will be in you. The major role, the Holy, the Holy Spirit does a lot of stuff, right? I don't know about you. I think of the gifts. I, I think of the fruit of the spirit. I think of, but isn't it interesting right out of the chute, his major role is to come alongside and comfort you and to encourage you. The Holy Spirit does not discourage you. That's the enemy. The Holy Spirit always wants to encourage you. In fact, this is the heart of God. I want you to see that today. That God's heart is encouragement and comfort. And you are most like him when you encourage other people. You are most like God when you are involved in the ministry of encouragement. Because that's the ministry and the anointing of the Holy Spirit. In Acts 9.31, And the church throughout Judea and Galilee and Samaria enjoyed a time of peace and was strengthened, living in the fear of the Lord, and get this, and encouraged by the Holy Spirit. They were encouraged by the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit who works through us to encourage. This isn't just some ministry that we organize and put together. This is the power of the Holy Spirit working through us to encourage one another. In Philippians 1.21, if there is any encouragement in Christ, he said, fulfill my joy and be like-minded. He said, we're going to be, we're going to be ambassadors of, of Christ. And the Holy Spirit fills us and dwells within us, and he is a comforter and encourager, so guess what? You are going to reflect that in your own life. In Romans 12, 6, we have different gifts according to the grace given to us, and then he goes through this list. Guess what's on the list? Verse 8, if you have the gift to encourage, then give encouragement. Wait a minute. You, you mean this is a gift from God? Supernaturally, like? Oh, Yeah. I want you to see this in a little different way because some, some of you are naturally encouragers. You know, it's your personality. Some of you not so much. But when the Holy Spirit comes through you, he can make you an encourager. 
John and Debbie Lindell, pastor of church in Springfield, uh, James River Assembly. I know Brother Ray is here today. He knows him well. He pastored here in Kansas for a while, didn't he? Before he went there, kind of got burned out. Things didn't go all that well for him. And so he ended up down in Springfield, which this is a massive church now. And, and uh, he, I love to hear him talk about it. He tried to talk him out of making him their pastor. He said, you don't want me. He said, I'm all burned out and used up. I'm so discouraged. And then well, he said they were sitting at Shoney's at the restaurant. And the, the elder said, you're just who we're looking for. And he thought, this guy's hard of hearing. <laughs> he must not. And they made him their pastor. And now you go down there, it's just, now there's campuses everywhere. And I remember he was here in Wichita, Ray. I don't know if you remember this or not. We're in a little pastor's meeting and some had a little Q&A. And somebody asked him this question. What did you do different in Springfield than you did in Kansas City? Do you remember his reply? Nothing. Nothing. It was a sovereign move of God, and God just breathed upon it. It doesn't have anything to do with me. I just showed up, you know. I was discouraged, beat up, run down, didn't have anything to offer. So I thought, and look what God did. And I remember a story that his wife, Debbie, told, really touched my heart about this ministry of encouragement and how the Holy Spirit can anoint you to do this. Because I believe sometimes the Lord will lead you to people to encourage. And the story is told that I know down that way, I don't know, they got uh, price choppers. Uh, I know we like to shop there in Branson, right? That's where you get your groceries. And, and so uh, uh, Debbie was going to price choppers that day, and she saw a lady in line getting ready, just had some, a whole bunch of cupcakes. And she just felt the Holy Spirit speak to her, pay for that lady's cupcakes. And so she said she didn't say anything to the lady, and she just butt in line, took her credit card, stuck it in the machine, took it out, walked away, never said a word. Well, this lady knew her, knew who she was, and laid her, later called her and said, what made you do that? She said, I just felt like that's what I was supposed to do. She said, you have no idea. She said, I didn't have any money to pay for those cupcakes, and my daughter had told me that day that she was responsible for bringing cupcakes to her class that day for all the students. And I couldn't break her heart. I couldn't disappoint her. And so I went to the store, and it's like the Lord told me, don't worry about it. You just go. And then you stepped in line. And you paid for my cupcakes. And my daughter never knew different, you know. She said, you gave me new hope. You encouraged me. You strengthened me that day. I mean, can it be that practical? It is the power of the Holy Spirit that can position you to encourage others. This man sitting here in the second row over here, Pastor Ray Pyle, he's been a great encouragement to me over the years. When I went through some times, difficult times, he would always speak life into me. And I think we've probably shared that with each other, that we need each other because there are times when you're going to be down and you're going to be discouraged. And evidently, God knew this. And so the whole thing's been set up. For this great ministry, he can't stop the enemy from discouraging us, but he can create the ministry of encouragement as an antidote to contradict it. Amen. The Lord, Proverbs, Psalms 34, 18, the Lord is close to those who, who are brokenhearted. He's, what? That's God's heart. He wants to come alongside, doesn't he? It's, it's amazing. And, and, and can I encourage you? We, to, sometimes God will encourage you to write a note to somebody. And I love, to, I love to go card shopping. And how many of you are like me? You want to find just the right card? Is that right? And then you find it and you go, whoa, that's it. That is the card. And you get it. And then you write something in it, right? And sometimes, and probably in that basket are cards like that. And, and there's a good scripture there. But you know, whenever I open a card like that, you know the first thing I want to do? I want to read what you wrote. I want to know what you had to say. Be specific in your encouragement. I mean, it's good to find a card that says the right thing, but you need to write. You need to speak in to that situation. You might think it's a little thing, doesn't mean much. It could make all the difference in the world. Amen? Let's finish reading the text because it's really cool. We're just gonna, I'm just going to go to verse 12, okay? Here it is. Pick it up with verse 4. Paul was accompanied by Sopater, the son 
of Paris from Berea, Aristarchus, Secundus from Thessalonica, Gaius from Derby, Timothy, also Tychicus, and Trophimus from the province of Asia. I'm glad we don't use those names anymore, aren't you? Yeah. <laughs> These men went on ahead and waited for us at Troas. But we sailed from Philippi after the festival of unleavened bread, and five days later joined the others at Troas, where we stayed seven days. Why is Luke giving us all these details? It must be important, right? He's wanting us to see something here. Well, th I think we see, we see the beauty and the complexity of the body of Christ. There's two names in here that are significant, Aristarchus and Secundus. You just read over those names. What do they mean? They're very important names because Aristarchus, that has a name, someone who's in high standing. You know, it's just somebody very important. And he's lumped in with Secundus. Secundus means second. He's a slave. Secundus is a slave because they, when you became a slave, they took your name away from you because they didn't want you to have that identity and they numbered you. You were number one, number two, number three, number four. This is number two. He's second. Isn't it fascinating to see the body of Christ and how God has put it together? Slave and free, rich and poor, Jew and Greek, male and female. You kind of all take it for granted. This was revolutionary. And here we see this group, and they're traveling together. Why are they with Paul anyway? Well, you'll have to read some of the other writings to find out. But they had taken up an offering for Jerusalem. And it was probably sizable. And they were all representing their churches. These are all people that have come out of the work. And they're going with him. What an encouraging thing to bring an offering to, to the mother church that was in great struggle. They needed, they were discouraged. And now the one who birthed you now needs encouragement. And the one you birthed now becomes the encourager. Isn't this amazing? And they're bringing this great gift. What a, it's going to put courage in the church and hope. Do you see it? And comfort. Keep reading. Verse 7. On the first day of the week, we came together to break bread. Paul spoke to the people, and because he intended to leave the next day, he kept on talking until midnight. Don't ever criticize me again for long sermons, okay? Here's, there were many lamps in the upstairs room where we were meeting. Seated in a window was a young man named Eutychus. By the way, it means fortunate. Fortunate's about to have an unfortunate situation happen to him because he was sinking into deep sleep as Paul talked on and on. How I many you know nothing new? Nothing new in the church, right? I see some of you nodding off sometimes. You know, I, I, used, to, I used to trip over that. I don't anymore. I'm honored if you come and sleep in church. I am. I'm thrilled because you could have stayed home and slept and you came. Thank you. Maybe you worked hard that night. Uh, hey, I, I'm th but I would give you a suggestion if, if, if you're going to sleep in church. Uh, get you a Bible and open it up and go like this. And no one will know. They'll think you're spiritual. They'll think you're just spiritual, right? So if you doze off once in a while, nothing new it happened here. But uh, unfortunately, something unfortunate happened to Mr. Fortune. Here he is, verse 9. Look at this. And when he was sound asleep, he fell to the ground from the third story and was picked up dead. Paul went down and threw himself on the young man and put his arms around him. Don't be alarmed, he said. He's alive. Then he went upstairs again, and he broke bread and ate. Is that just really? I, I love this story. What? After talking until daylight, he left. And the people took the young man home alive and were greatly comforted, encouraged. Hmm. <laughs> I, I love this story because I'm just trying to put myself in it. I mean, if somebody fell out the window and died, I think service would be over. <laughs> but no, he goes. Does it remind you of another Old Testament story? Remember Elijah laid on top of the person that needed to be raised up, the child? And so, I don't know. Was, was he really dead? Well, Luke's a doctor. He ought to know. He said he was dead, so I think he was. It was a miracle that took place. That's encouraging, isn't it? Miracles are encouraging. They really are when God moves in. But here, here we see, and then they just pick it up where they left off, and they keep on eating and speaking until the morning hours. Why? Encouragement. Here's the third opportunity. It always comes from encouragement. It creates community. 
Encour the ministry of encouragement always creates community. Remember, Aristarchus, Secundus, they're, they're in this new community. Isn't this amazing? Why is church so important? Because it's a place of encouragement. I, sometimes I can't wait to get here. And I'm the preacher. But I just love being around you. And, and like I said earlier, Connie and I, I've never been in a place where, where people speak encouragement to me all the time. Uh, I have people coming up. You okay, Pastor? You okay? Yeah, I'm okay. I just, hey, been praying for you. Uh, and they just send you little notes. And you have no idea. Uh, that's community. And you know, if I was the enemy, the first priority I'd have is get you separated from community. Why? So I can discourage you. Because if you stay in community, the ministry of encouragement will be there. And that, that's not what the, the enemy wants to discourage us and paralyze us. Listen to what Hebrews 10 says. We keep coming back to it because it's foundational. He says, let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. And let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do, but encourage one another, especially as the day of return is drawing. See, it, why do we meet? Why do we come together? It's to encourage one another. And, and so it creates this level of community that, that's, I believe, God ordained. In fact, at First Thessalonians, the fourth chapter is down on your screen, but you know, having funerals this week, I, I'm drawn to that, of course, that reference because we're going to be reading this at funerals. And it says, don't sorrow as those who have no hope. Isn't hope part of encouragement? All right, so don't, and he goes in, he tells you everything's going to happen. And how's he end it? Verse 18, he's therefore, encourage one another with these words. Can you be encouraged when you're sad? Yeah, and, and think about in Paul's day, Stephen's funeral, that would have been a hard one, wouldn't it? When they stoned him to death, how many graves did they see? How many people had to die? And yet, there, and would, could you be discouraged? Yeah, oh man, what, what's coming next? I might be next. Huh? Well, that's why we need the ministry of encouragement. Hey, listen, you need to know this. You know, we got hope. And, and even though we're dead, we're going to live. And we're going to live forever. And so nothing can happen to us. And, and wow, this is, hey, this is what you can expect. This is what's going to happen. Wow, I needed that. Thank you. That encourages me. Acts 4.36, we all know this from our series. Our good friend Barnabas, his name's really Joseph. And he shows up in Acts and they gave him a nickname. What was his nickname? Barnabas, his real name's Joseph. What does it mean? Son of encouragement. How'd you like to have a nickname like that? I want to be known as an encourager. How about you? Some of you, well, don't go around that guy. He'll discourage you, man. He'll suck the life right out of you. You don't want to be around that person, right? You know, people like that. Versus this, man, I want to go over there because whenever I'm around them, I always feel encouraged and build up. Man, that's the kind of life I want to have. Well, that was Barnabas. And in this story, evidently he had some money. He was from the tribe of Levi. And uh, he, he sold a field that he owned and brought money to those who are in need. That's what encouragers do. You know, they meet other people's needs. That, that's what they were doing in the group that Paul was with. That, that's, a, that's a ministry of encouragement. Uh, your need is my need, and so we're going to come alongside. And what are we going to do? We're going to bring comfort. We're going to bring courage. We're going to deposit courage. To encourage is to put courage in people. To discourage is to take it out. And so I don't want to be, I don't want to be a discourager. I want to be an encourager. In Acts 9.26, when Saul arrived in Jerusalem after this little experience on the road to Damascus, remember, this is the guy that killed Christians. It says he tried to meet with the believers, but they were afraid of him. Well, sure. And they did not believe that he truly was a believer. But Barnabas. But Barnabas stepped in and he brought him to the apostles and he told them how Saul had seen the Lord on the way to Damascus and how the Lord had spoken to Saul. Isn't that great? So, Paul, so Saul stayed with the apostles and went all around Jerusalem with them preaching boldly in the name of the Lord. If it wasn't for the son of encouragement, that would have never happened. Acts eleven twenty five. Later, Paul goes back, Saul goes back to his hometown and the church is still progressing and it says, then Barnabas looking around he realized, hey, I need to go get Saul. So he goes to Tarsus to look for Saul and to bring him back. If Barnabas had not done that, how would things have been different? Barnabas never wrote a word of scripture. But if it wasn't for Barnabas, you wouldn't have most of your New Testament today. Because of his encouragement with Saul, who later would become Paul, we would never have the scriptures we have today, all because of Barnabas. 
How many of you like reading the Gospel of Mark? Do you enjoy that book, do you? Without Barnabas, you wouldn't have it. Because you remember the little conflict that Saul had with John Mark? And they parted ways. Who stepped in? Barnabas, son of encouragement. He says, I'll take him. I'll take him with me. And they went off in a different direction. And Saul went off in a different direction. And later their relationship would be restored. And when, when, In fact, when Paul was in need of encouragement, guess what he wrote? He said, go get Mark. Go get John Mark. He'll be very profitable to me. Something happened and they'd been, the son of encouragement is usually a bridge builder. How many of you are, some of you are just natural bridge builders. You just, when there's a conflict, God just brings you into it. You just, you're anointed for the purpose. And so I want to just encourage you that this, this ministry of encouragement, it, it's far reaching. You can change people's perspective through encouragement. You may set things in motion that you don't even know about that could have tremendous effects into the future just because you were speaking courage and comfort and hope into somebody else's life. Amen? Do you hear that today? I believe this ministry is for you, but can I just give you one other thing before we go? Before we come to the table, this is very important. And we're talking about being encouragers, but here's something else. You need to be willing to receive encouragement. You ever tried to encourage someone, didn't want to be encouraged? They kind of resisted you and fought you. I want to encourage you, keep encouraging anyway. But those of you who are maybe in that situation and you're hiding what's going on in your life, you don't want anybody to know your situation and you know, you're kind of a, self-made man and uh, I'm fine I'm good I'm okay listen God's wanting to encourage you the enemy wants you to isolate yourself and separate yourself from community but that that's why it's important that we gather together that's why the enemy doesn't want you to value community he doesn't want the coming together of the saints to be a high priority because it makes you vulnerable and he knows that the closer we are the more encouraged we will be and also those of you who are a little hesitant I want to just encourage you today would you be willing just to open yourself up to let someone encourage you today. Just don't, don't, don't build walls. Just open your heart because God wants, this is a ministry that's ordained by the Holy Spirit and it's what makes the church powerful. Of all the things the Holy Spirit does, this, this is so important. So we're gonna, we're gonna come to the table today, all right? We're gonna come to the table and I wanna reflect as we do on Deuteronomy 31. This will encourage you. God's talking to the children of Israel but I believe you can embrace this. He says, do not be afraid or discouraged for the Lord will personally go ahead of you. He will be with you. He will neither fail you nor abandon you. Does that comfort you today? Does that put courage in you just hearing that? Mm -hmm. Does that fill you with hope? You know what hope is? Hope is not for what you have. Hope is for what you don't have. And that's the greatest point of discouragement the enemy uses is the future that you don't know. And he gets you to worry and fret. God wants to put a hope inside of you. It's just this assurance. This is that scripture. God's with me. He, I don't need to be discouraged. Uh, he's, he's going ahead of me. That's future. Did you know God's already been to your future? He's already been there. You don't have to worry about it. You know why you don't need to worry? Because worry involves fear. And God's not giving us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. Man, that's encouraging. Amen. I want you to leave here different than you came today. I want you, one, to be encouraged, but I also want you to become an encourager of others. I want you to be strengthened today. I want you to have endurance. God's wanting to restore some of you. I know some of your stories and you've been hitting it pretty heavy, and I sense that some of you are ready to give up. I just want to encourage you. I just want to encourage you. Keep going. Maybe you're like Redmond. You're on the track, and everybody's running past you. The Father's coming. And he's going to help you. You might have to limp through it, but you, you'll get through it. And God never said our life would be rosy, but he did say, I'll fill you with courage, and I'll fill you with hope, and I'll comfort you, and we're going to go through life together, and you're going to be encouraged. The enemy is not going to be able to discourage us. He's not going to do it. And God is with us. He's already been before us, and he will be with us, and he will never abandon you. Amen? That's how we're coming to the table today with that understanding. This is the table of encouragement. Morgan said Friday night, she was leading us in worship. She said, you know, if God never does another thing for me, he's already done enough. 
for me to praise him for all eternity. Wow. Is that true? This is it. If this is it, it's enough. It's enough. This is the place we come today, and God's going to fill us with courage. And this is the place of hope. This is the place of comfort. If you have never opened your heart up to a personal relationship with Jesus, today is your day. God brought you here, however he brought you here, I don't know. But he's, you just sense he's reaching into your heart right now, and he's drawing you to himself. He's drawing you because he loves you, and he wants to come alongside of you, and he wants to walk with you. And if that's you, and you've never, ever come to the table, you've never taken the cup and bread, I encourage you today to come for the first time and take the cup and bread as an act of faith, saying, I believe, I believe what Jesus did was for me, and I'm going to accept his, his forgiveness I'm going to surrender my life to him. If that's you, I encourage you to come and take the cup for the first time. And at the end of the service, you come forward and let me pray with you. And we'll walk together. Amen. Because God doesn't want you to walk alone. Oh, isn't that great? How many of you are encouraged today? That's the Holy Spirit. That's what he's wanting to do, Father, as we come. We're coming to the table of encouragement. And Lord, I pray you just lift our spirits today. Lord, I pray that we could be strengthened. I pray that we'd have a new endurance in our life to keep going no matter what. I pray for the anointing of the Holy Spirit to rest upon us with supernatural encouragement that we might encourage others. I pray, Father, for a fresh community that we could be drawn in to community and we don't have to be alone, but we can walk together. Thank you, Father. Thank you. We love you and we love each other in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. I invite you to come down the center aisle, make your way to the side table, take the cup and bread, Return to your seat, and then we're going to receive it together, okay? God bless you as you come. You give love.